This morning we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Shouldn't come as any surprise. Perhaps the uh, clearest words given in Scripture as to the character of the Scriptures themselves. And um, just want to remind you that we are looking at the, well, I guess you might say the series, Why We Believe What We Believe. And in this case, we're looking at why we believe the Bible is God's Word. Let's begin by reading just a small portion of 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. I'll read through verse 17. Paul writes to Timothy, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now let me just begin here by saying something which is uh, fairly obvious. When Paul says that Timothy has known these things from childhood, he's obviously referring to the Old Testament scriptures, which are not antiquated, they're not done away with, but they are the word of God. All scripture is inspired by God. What Paul writes, what Peter writes, what the uh, writers of the Gospels write, that is the word of God and it is breathed out by the Lord. Now we're going to want to understand what that means. And we're certainly going to want to see that the Bible is, in fact, God's word. Let me just point out that so far in the series, we have seen some evidence to the fact that God does exist. And if you weren't here for that, I would recommend that you uh, review that. It certainly is very compelling evidence. And by the way, I should mention that when you share an argument with someone, uh, I, I don't mean when you get into an argument with someone, but when you share an argument for a particular thing we believe regarding the Christian faith, even if the argument is sound, even if it's powerful, don't expect them to roll over. You know, don't expect them to say, oh, you're right. I mean, they may see it, and because of the sinfulness of their heart, they're going to reject it unless God changes their heart. So just because they don't accept it and don't say, oh, you're right and I'm wrong, don't think that the, power, that the argument isn't powerful. Don't think that it's not correct. It is, and you need to still be convinced of that and push it forward even if they don't acquiesce to it. Just because they choose not to believe it doesn't mean that it isn't true. So again, we did see evidence just by virtue of the information that is in living, uh, in living entities, in, in living creatures. There is just volumes and volumes of information as well as a mechanism to put that information to use, as well as a context in which it's understood and as I pointed out, I think subsequent to that, a lot of that information is simply information on how to use the information that's there. It's amazing, all this information, where did it come from? Where did personality come from? Where did consciousness come from? Where did purpose come from? Uh, where did morality come from? Those are things that, that the ground and the sun don't contain. And yet evolutionists believe that's where it came from. But again, the greater cannot come from the lesser. Again, one of the arguments for God's existence. We also looked at the fact that God is triune. And again, I would refer you to that because that is how God reveals himself. That is the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, this morning, I want us to consider that the Bible is God's word. That God not only exists, this one who actually you know, put all these things together and provided that information and again all the things we've seen, the mechanism to put it to work, who makes dead matter alive and able to, as it were, move on its own and read information and do things that enables us to live. But this God has also revealed himself. Now he's revealed himself as in one way which you've already seen. I mean, the creation itself, Paul says, speaks of the glory of God that his Invisible attributes are clearly seen through the creation so that everyone in the world is without excuse as far as their belief that God exists. 
God has made it abundantly clear. But God has also revealed himself in words. He has given to us a book which we call the Bible. What I want us to do this morning is look at several of the ways in which the Bible shows itself, apart from all the other books that have been written in the world, to be God's word. So I want us to look at eight, eight arguments. Now I realize that eight sounds like a lot. Some of them are very brief, some of them are a little bit longer. But these are just eight of numerous reasons that we could use to demonstrate that the Bible is the word of God. So if you, if you have your handouts, this will be easy to follow along. If you don't, you can jot them along or jot them down as I read them. Let me just preview them. First of all, we believe it's his word because it says it is. Secondly, because it reveals the future. Thirdly, because all its authors agree perfectly. Fourthly, because it doesn't contain any absurdities. Fifthly, because of the miracles that God did to authenticate it. Uh, sixthly, because it's the only book that is able to transform the heart and so the life. Seventhly, because it's the only book that reveals the God that we see revealed in nature. And then lastly, because God's spirit confirms that it is. So let's take a look at these uh, somewhat briefly. Again, to uh, confirm to those of us that it, this is in fact the word of God, to equip those of us who may be in the future arguing that this book is set apart from all the other books as the word of God, or maybe for those of you this morning who are here who may not believe that it is the word of God, perhaps the Lord will use one or more of these arguments to open your eyes to that fact. So why do we believe the Bible is the word of God? Well, first of all, because it says it is. Now, that may not be a very compelling argument to some of us. To others, it's very compelling. Out of all the religious books in the world, why do we believe that the Bible is the word of God? Now, again, there, there are several reasons. And the first one is because it says it is. Now, is that a valid argument? Well, of course it is. But why is that argument valid? Well, it, it's because the Bible is the word of God. And what God says is true. And when his word says, or when God says in his word that all his word is God breathed. That's what the word here inspired means. All scripture or the holy writings are breathed out by God. The words themselves are the very words that God intended to give to us and they are all absolutely true in everything that they say whether what it is we are to believe about God or what it is we are to do as far as how to serve this God or what it is we must do in order to be saved. All of it is exactly what he wants us to know. It is his word. If it didn't claim to be his word, then we wouldn't take it to be his word. But certainly, not only is it his word, but it makes that claim that it is the word of God or it tells us that it is. Now, why isn't this true of other books? that also claim to be God's word. I should mention, first of all, there really aren't that many books in the world that claim to be the word of God. There's relatively few. But really, the reason why the other books that claim to be aren't is because, or why that's not a valid argument for them, is because they are not the word of God. And so we shouldn't believe what they say. Now again, it's a simple argument, but it is a valid argument. If this is in fact God's word, and it tells us that it is, we should believe it. I hope you can agree with me on that. But again, there are other arguments for those perhaps who don't believe the Bible is the word of God. The next argument I think is perhaps one of the most compelling, and that is because the Bible itself predicts the future. Now it predicts the future, not only future from where we are, but it predicted the future in the past and those predictions have come true, which give us the confidence not only that it's the word of God, but also the things he says that are going to happen in the future are also going to happen in the future. God, in dealing with his people, told them about things that were going to happen that were future to them. So that when those things took place, and again, it wouldn't be so far ahead that the people wouldn't be able to see that it was going to take place, 
But when it took place, they would know that God had spoken. Now, this is what we read in Amos, Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. And there's a reason why the Lord, as I've said, would tell them in advance so he could tell the people in advance, and that is so that when those things came about, they would know that God had spoken. Moses writes this in Deuteronomy 18.22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The, spoken ha the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. The implication is, of course, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord about something that does come to pass, then that message was from him. Now, the Bible contains many predictions, some that had a very short, um, I should say they were given just a short time before the actual event so that the people who, were, uh, who heard the message would know that God had in fact spoken, that that messenger was from him, and that what, they gave, what he gave to them was in fact the word of God. But there were also more long-range predictions. I mean, we might say short-range predictions. Perhaps they just got lucky. And they happened to hit it. They saw the times. They saw, you know, the, the armies. Uh, and they saw that perhaps the, the hearts of the kings were against them and that battle was imminent. And so they made some kind of prediction about something that, well, everybody knew was going to come about. But actually, they made some predictions that didn't, they weren't fulfilled for, in, in, well, in many cases, a thousand years about things that the people on the other end would have no control over. And I think some of the most powerful predictions or prophecies that have been fulfilled in this way are those that have to do with our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Again, things were said about him hundreds of years, even a thousand years, before they actually happened, and they came about exactly as the Lord said they would. For instance, where Jesus would be born. In Micah 5, 2, we read this. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Jesus Christ is God and man. He is the one who has existed from eternity. He is the one who would be born in Bethlehem. He is the one who would be ruler in Israel. Where was Jesus born? Luke 2, verses 4 through 7. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in claws and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, Micah wrote what he wrote about 700 B.C., and Luke recorded what took place about 3 B.C. We're talking about 700 years, the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke himself says he was not an eyewitness, but he spoke to eyewitnesses, and he, he got every fact confirmed before he wrote his gospel, the account of the life of Jesus Christ. He was an historian. And he has left us this eyewitness account. And by the way, he's not the only one who saw it. Many people did. The Old Testament tells us how Jesus Christ would come into the world. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now again, Matthew records for us the fulfillment of this. And Matthew, again, though he may not have seen this personally, he got it from those who experienced it. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Isaiah wrote around 700 B.C., and he talks about what was going to happen, that this virgin was going to be with child. Well, how can a virgin be with child? That part perhaps he didn't understand, but when the, the, well, when the birth of Christ comes, it's, it's understood. When the conception takes place, it would be by the Holy Spirit in order that this one may be the Son of God. And that's exactly what took place. And it was fulfilled again around 3 B.C., 700 years before the event. In the Old Testament, we see what it is that Jesus Christ would do. Again, from the prophet Isaiah, encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. You see, when the Lord comes, he was going to do particular Miracles, he, and actually miracles, one of the things we're going to see is, is another evidence of the fact that the Bible is God's word. But what Isaiah predicts of this one who would be born of the virgin and born in Bethlehem actually comes true as well as eyewitness accounts give us in Matthew eleven two through 5. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You see, Jesus, in doing these works, was fulfilling what Isaiah said would be true of this one who was coming. And so instead of just go back to John and tell him, I'm the one, he says, go back to John and tell him what you've heard and what you've seen. I am that one that was predicted. 700 years before he comes into the world again, we see these things actually taking place. We even see how he would die. David writes in Psalm 22, 16 through 18, For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. David wrote that 1000 BC. And John records this again as an eyewitness in John chapter 19 at the crucifixion. And by the way, the crucifixion, you know, is where they nail a man to a cross and the nails go through his hands and they go through his feet. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now nobody told those soldiers to cast lots over the, the garments of Jesus Christ, and they, they were Romans. They didn't even know about what David had written in the Psalms, and yet it happened exactly as David said. It would happen. And certainly, Jesus on the cross, if he were a mere man, had no control over what they were doing to him or to his clothing. This was predicted a thousand years before it actually took place. And then that Jesus Christ would be raised again. David writes in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, a thousand years again before the event, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul 
to Sheol, which is the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, Peter quotes that on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 29 through 32, to point out that this was fulfilled by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, he was buried and underwent decay. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, again, Sheol or the grave, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Again, the prediction a thousand years before it took place, Peter speaking on behalf of the disciples, God raised him just as David said that he would, and we are all witnesses of that fact. Now, I've only given you a few of the over 300 prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled. And again, if he were a mere man, many of these, most of these, he would have no control over. How can you control where you're born? How can you control how you're going to die? You can't control these things. Only the one who controls the future has control over these things, and only the one who has control over these things can tell you precisely what's going to happen in the future. The Bible is God's word. It's the only book that can predict the future with certainty and those things be fulfilled. Now, thirdly, I already mentioned this one before because all of its authors agree perfectly. Now, again, we can hardly get two people to agree on anything, especially in controversial matters. I think you know what I'm talking about. How many disagreements have you been in? But especially in controversial matters, and there is nothing more controversial than religion. I mean, just look at all the different sects and religions in the world, and look at all the fights that have gone on, even in-house, in different religious organizations, sadly, even within the church. But the authors of Scripture the men that God used that were moved by his Holy Spirit all agree on everything that they wrote. And there's over 40 different authors from many different walks of life. I mean, we have fishermen, we have farmers, we have shepherds, we have physicians, we have governors and kings. They wrote over a period of 1,500 years. And yet they spoke with absolute agreement, all speaking about the theme of the Bible, which is Jesus Christ, the one who would come to crush the serpent's head, the one that caused the fall of mankind in the first place, the one who would overcome him and destroy him and save his people. Now, not only do they agree regarding the events of the gospel, they agree also on who God is and what he says in, in every area and many other things. Not only that, but I'm sure you know that even the history that's contained in the Bible, the historic facts about the cultures and the times in which these things took place, all of those things are also written with absolute accuracy. You know, each time somebody has tried to prove that something in the Bible is wrong, they have discovered that they, in fact, were wrong and the Bible is right. There have even been some pretty high-profile archaeologists who were believers who put out a challenge offering a cash reward to anyone who could prove anything in the Bible was inaccurate and no one has ever been able to collect on those rewards. Again, what human book can boast of that kind of accuracy and that kind of agreement? There is no such human book. Fourthly, we believe the Bible is the word of God because it doesn't contain absurdities, such as the world is flat, you know, whereas we, we learn a little bit more about the, the, uh, the world in which we live and the universe, and after a while you say, you know what, we used to believe the world was flat. That's what this book said, and that's what people believed, but now we see it's round. Well, you know what? The Bible doesn't say that the world is flat. The Bible doesn't say that it rides on the backs of elephants. You know, there, there is a religious book that says that, and that whenever we have an earthquake, it's because the elephants are moving. The Bible doesn't contain absurdities like that. As a matter of fact, everything we see in the Bible is consistent with what we even know now regarding the world and the universe in which we live. As a matter of fact, it, it's even more accurate than our scientists 
in that regard. The more they study, the more, this, the more they see that the Bible is true. Fifthly, we believe that the Bible is the word of God because of the miracles that God did in order to prove it, in order to authenticate it. God gave his messengers, in, in most cases, the ability to do miracles so that it would stop traffic and that the people who saw these things would listen and would know that God was speaking because they would do things that only God could do. That is, he, they would work, as it were, outside the ordinary laws of nature. Now, Jesus preached and Jesus taught, but he also did many miracles. And he didn't do the kind of miracles that people do today. Those are the kinds that can't be seen. But he did the kinds that were genuine miracles, the ones that could be seen and the ones that actually did stop traffic. Whenever somebody saw something Jesus did, it amazed them. In other words, they were flabbergasted. Have you seen a miracle like that lately? I haven't. But that's the kind of miracles God did in order to, to authenticate his word. Now, here me give you a couple of examples in Matthew 9, verses 32 through 33. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Again, I, in my past, I've seen a lot of people who claim to do miracles, and I've seen a lot of people who claim to have received miracles, but I saw nothing. What these people saw amazed them, and they said, nothing like this has ever been seen. Now, this is my favorite one, the next one, Luke 8, verses 22 through 25. Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now, that would certainly stop traffic, wouldn't it, if somebody was able to command the wind, and not just the wind, but also the waves. I mean, when the wind stops, it still takes a while for the waves to die down, but he stopped the waves as well as the wind. They obeyed him. That was not only a miracle, but it also demonstrated who this one was, God in human flesh. So much so that his disciples, who were eyewitnesses of it, were afraid of him. Who is this person? that can command the creation, and it obeys him. Well, these miracles, like the prophecies and the fulfillment of these prophecies, were recorded by eyewitnesses, and they prove that Jesus is the Son of God, and it also proves that what Jesus said regarding the Word of God is undoubtedly true. Jesus treated the Scriptures as the Word of God. He called them the Word of God. That's what they are, and that's why we should believe it. Now, sixthly, we should believe the Bible is the word of God because it's the only book which is able to transform a person's life. It's the only book that's really able to reveal what is in our hearts, how far short we fall of the glory of God, of what is good and right. The Bible tells us why it is our consciences convict us when we do things that are wrong because God has given us the voice of conscience that is informed by his word, by his law, even if we've never heard it before. We know that we're doing things that are wrong. And when we read the Bible, we see why it is we feel the way we feel, because we are, in fact, doing things that the Bible says are wrong. The Bible is the only religious book that has ever been written that actually condemns mankind and consigns him to hell. Most books, well, actually, all the other religious books that men write basically talk about how great man is rather than what a sinner he is. Men write books that paint themselves in virtuous colors, but God writes a book that tells it the way it is. This is what our true nature is. This is our condition. 
This is why we need a Savior. And this book contains the only message that the Lord has ever used to transform a man from that former condition into the condition of one who is growing into the image of Christ because the Bible is the only book that contains the gospel. As I mentioned earlier, the gospel is not just that narrow message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, but more broadly, it is everything that has to do with the work of redemption, which is what the whole Bible is about, the work of Jesus Christ to save sinners and why it is we need salvation. The Bible is the only book that is able to convict us in this way and is able to reveal to us the way of salvation. That's why we believe it is the word of God. Now, seventh, it's, we believe that is the word of God because it's the only book that reveals a God that is revealed in nature. Now, God says in his word that he is clearly seen through the creation in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And as we study the creation, we've already seen several things about it. We've seen that, you know, because of what we are and the fact that whatever made us had to be at least, I mean, it has to be greater than we are. We can't be greater than what made us. We have conscience, we have personality, we have morality, uh, we have purpose. Uh, whatever is true of us must be true of the Creator. Now, we've already seen those things are true, but as we study nature more thoroughly, we find out that it reveals a God who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable, a single God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, wise, and, of course, has these attributes that we've just seen that are true in us. The God that is revealed in the Bible is the same God that is revealed in nature. And as you compare other religious books, the, divi the divine being or whatever it is that's revealed in those books is nothing like the God of creation. So what I'm saying is the book of nature and the book of special revelation, the Bible, agree. And it's the only book that actually does reveal the same God we see revealed in nature. That's why we believe it to be the, the Word of God. But finally, we believe it without a doubt because God's Spirit confirms it. Now, that is true of you if you are a believer because this is what the Spirit of God is able to do. This is, in fact, what He does do. He convinces us beyond a shadow of a doubt, even if we didn't have the evidence that we've just looked at, he would still convince us of that truth because that is what the Spirit of God does. I mean, he not only opens our eyes to see our need of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he opens our eyes to see that the Bible is true so that we will not only see our need of Jesus Christ, but we'll know who he is and who it is we ought to trust. It is the Spirit's work to do this. So really, I don't have to prove to you that the Bible is the Word of God. God is perfectly capable of doing that himself. And that is what he will do if that is what he wills. So let me just say to you this morning that if God has not already convinced you of the fact that the Bible is his word, then I pray that God would do so, that he would open your eyes by his Holy Spirit and convince you that what is in the Bible is not something to be trifled with. It's not something that is a myth, a legend, something that's neither here nor there but something that God has written, something that God takes very seriously, and something you need to take seriously as well. May the Lord open your eyes to see that the Bible warns you of danger, that you have sinned. God has given you that voice of conscience to convince you that you have sinned and that you need, because of that, salvation, because judgment is coming because of your sins. Now, that's one thing the Bible says. May he convince you that that's true, but may he convince you as well of what is also true in Scripture and what we've already seen in many passages already of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible not only tells us of our condition because of Adam's sin and because of all of our sins and our condemnation, it also tells us what God has done in order to save us from that condemnation, in order to redeem us through his son that we might eventually go to heaven. 
And it tells us what we have to do in order to receive that salvation. We just simply need to trust Jesus Christ. Trust him to do what he has done for us. Turn from our sins and begin to follow after him. The Bible says if you're willing to put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you're willing to repent of your sins, if you're willing to follow him, that he will grant to you forgiveness of sins and eternal life. He will take you to be with him forever in heaven. Now, the Bible has been right about everything that it has said so far. Should we believe what it says about the future and about judgment? Should we believe about things we can't see, heaven and hell? Well, I think we, we should. Even if we didn't have the Spirit of God, there is enough in the Bible to show us that there is there's nothing ordinary about this book. This book is God's words. But especially if we have the Spirit of God working in our consciences to convict us of that very thing, we should pay attention to it and believe that what it says is true. There is a heaven and a hell. There is a judgment coming. Now, sadly, we don't know the day of our death, and we don't know how much time we have, do we? We may think, well, this is something, maybe I should take it seriously if I don't have to right now because I'm young and I've got... 80 years ahead of me, or I've got 70 years ahead of me, or I've got 60 years ahead of me, so I really don't have to take it seriously yet. That's certainly what the devil will tell you. That's certainly what your flesh will tell you, because it doesn't want you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the devil doesn't want you to come to Jesus Christ. They want to keep you in your sin and under condemnation. But do you realize you have no guarantee of another minute of life? There may be something going on in your body right now that you're completely unaware of, or perhaps a, an artery that may burst and you could bleed to death in a few minutes. You may be on your way home and get into an accident. Somebody runs through a, a light and, and smashes right into your door and you're dead. You may even trip and fall and break your neck. It's happened. You don't know the day of your death. You don't know how much time you have. But you do know that right now, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven and you will have everlasting life. This is not something you can afford to put off. You need to listen to what God's word says and respond to it now. As a matter of fact, we're all responding to it right now one way or the other. We're either deciding to accept it or we're deciding to reject it. I would encourage you, I would admonish you, I would exhort you, trust in Jesus Christ now while the opportunity is there. The Lord is offering you salvation. That's the reason why there's a person in this pulpit speaking to you this morning, is because that's God's will, that that offer be made to you. And so listen to what he has to say and believe. Now let me just mention one last thing. For those of us who are already Christians, you can use these proofs and you can try to demonstrate to people that the Bible is the word of God and there's nothing wrong with, with doing that. But realize as well that you don't have to prove the Bible is the word of God before you use the Bible as the word of God because God is perfectly capable of convincing people of its truth apart from your argumentation, apart from my argumentation. He is able to do it. All you really need to do is just simply share the word of God with someone else. And God is able to work through that. Again, as Spurgeon has said, and we've been reminded on numerous occasions, don't try to prove how powerful it is. Just show them how powerful it is by opening the cage, by opening your mouth, by letting those words out, and speaking them again with conviction like you believe it. If you don't look like you believe it, I'm not sure how the Lord will use it. But if they can see in your life and they can hear in your voice that you are serious about these things, they will take it seriously. And I believe God will be able to work more effectively through it. God does things in that way. And he works through people who have a very, very strong conviction. God will convince whom he wills, when he wills, by his word and his spirit, but people need to hear the word. The word has to get out. Don't expect them to be converted by the book of nature because it doesn't have the gospel. It only tells us that God exists. He has only revealed the gospel in the word of God 
He has entrusted the word of God to us, his church, as a treasure. We are the ones who are supposed to be communicating it with other people. Now, we might say, why didn't he appoint the angels to do it? Why has he called me to do it? Well, because he's given you that privilege. It's an honor to be able to do it. Plus, he wants those of like nature to share with those of like nature because we can relate to people better. You know, we can um, communicate better. We can empathize with people better. That's the reason why Jesus Christ became a man, in order to communicate to us. One of the reasons. Not, not to mention the fact, of course, that he had to become a man in order to die for us. But he also, you might say, is the, the ultimate accommodation by God to communicate in our language. God becomes a man. The Son of God becomes man. And he walks among us and he communicates to us. He teaches us. He preaches he reveals everything we need to know regarding salvation. He lives the life God calls him to live, perfect life, which is, of course, what he wanted to do. And then he dies on the cross for sinners, buried, is raised again, and ascends into heaven. He is the ultimate accommodation, though. He reveals to us the word of God. And that's why the Lord has chosen us, people, to communicate to other people his message. So don't feel like you have to Prove it before you can use it. Just use it. God is able to prove it. And he will to those whom he wills. And we'll see a little bit more about that this evening. Well, let's, uh, let's bow then in a moment of silent prayer. And let's ask that the Lord might be pleased to apply his word uh, in the many different ways in which he could do that in our lives this morning, in the particular way that we need to hear it. So let's spend a few moments in prayer.